Norman Wynarski is a venture advisor, lecturer, author, and angel investor. He is past president of SRI Ventures at SRI International, a world-leading research institute founded by Stanford University in 1946. He was a co-founder and board member of Siri, which was spun out from SRI in January 2008 and acquired by Apple in April 2010. Norman works with entrepreneurs, startups, research institutes, and major companies to create breakthrough ventures or products. He is an author, a leader, a lecturer, an Emmy Award winner, and is here to speak to us today about his new book, If You Really Want to Change the World, A Guide to Creating, Building, and Sustaining Breakthrough Ventures. Welcome to Google, Norman. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so um, this is a pleasure. And first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and those who are connecting, I believe, are many as well. And I want you to feel free to ask questions. This is, uh, my guess is, an audience that's particularly important, for me at least, to want to reach. And where I stand matters. So is it better over here? Probably? OK. Um, as long as I'm not blocking that. I particularly want to reach you because um, the kind of, the, this book, which is what we're, this meeting, this, this event is all about, is not about creating just any venture um, and building and sustaining. It's about breakthrough ventures. And so first question to you is, how many of you would actually like to start a venture or be part of a, a startup venture? Could you raise your hands? OK. And what I define by breakthrough venture is one that um, will have an impact on the world, one that people's passion was so important that they really want to have a positive benefit on millions of people. Uh, that kind of venture, how many people would like to and have an idea for that kind of venture that they'd like to achieve? OK. So that's what this is about. So that's what is distinguished. Um, if you look up on Amazon, something like entrepreneurship or innovation or something like that, you'll get about 50 to 70,000 books. That's not a good reason to write a book in that space then, unless you really have something you really want to make a difference on. So why did I write it? First of all, I think the story of Siri is not just a story about how we created a company, but it's about a process we used to create that company. And that was a process that I wanted to share. So the second is, that's the guide. The, the process we've done, and by the way, my co-author is Henry Crisell. He was a managing director at Warburg Pincus um, and helped create many companies. So the book is about our experiences, about somewhere between 10 and 20 companies that we've helped create that had that kind of breakthrough impact. So remarkably, the kind of impact that uh, the kind of, uh, of um, companies that we've created, they've not had a, a new formula or a new flavor for how we created them. So what I'm really telling you is information that most great entrepreneurs and most great venture capitalists would consider already having been part of their approach. Okay? This is not, you know the next great flavor or the next great diet on how to create ventures. This is about how our experience has been over several decades and dozens of companies on what it took to create those great ventures. OK. Um, <clears throat> I also feel, especially having come from SRI, that we want to create ventures that really make a difference, which are often in areas now that are deep technology or deeply difficult to commercialize. Things that relate to medical devices, clean water, energy, um, helping the world in many different ways. And researchers and engineers and technologists often don't feel that that's an opportunity for venture capital and investment. And I, I, I'm here to say that's not true, that you can create great ventures from those technologies as well. Um, the other point is, and, and you'll read it, if you read it in the book, in the first few pages, 
this is not about the, the, the narrow segment of ventures that are usually software ventures that you can get out into the market with you know, 50K or less of money, get some family money, and start pivoting often, fail fast, fail often, and get to something. Okay, this is against that model. You can succeed with that model. It's not like I'm trying to say you can't. But it's not the kind of model where you, if you really want to go out and really, that's why the word really is emphasized in the book, intend to change the world, that's not the model I would recommend you start with. And so we'll be talking about that model. Um, the other thing is while I'm talking, I'm, I've set aside like 30 minutes or so for presentation and another 30 for discussion. But I, I'm a teacher too, so I, I just, uh, just finished my first semester uh, or class at Stanford. I'm teaching the GSB second year graduate students there. Um, so I like questions. So if any of you feel that you need to understand, that will really uh, make it an engaging time. And the harder the question, the better, OK? Uh, first of all, my experience, though, why am I here? Uh, one is by SRI. I created the SRI venture and commercialization process. And so, um, and out of that, we've created about 70 uh, companies. And, um, and out of those 70 companies, four have IPO'd. Many have been acquired. The total market value is about $25 billion. Um, and brought back to SRI about $350 million. One of the important things about that, by the way, is it wasn't just ventures. It's ventures and royalty and equity. And that has bring, brought in an ongoing stream of revenue uh, every year, somewhere between 10 and 40 million on average per year. SRI is about, is founded by Stanford. It also, RCA Labs, where I came from, uh, was acquired by SRI. GE actually donated a billion dollar donation of RCA Labs to SRI when GE bought R RCA and didn't know what to do with consumer electronics. That's what happened then. Jack Welsh was there. I was on the merger team. That was like having arrived on Ellis Island and being turned back. But it was the best thing that happened to us. Um, 2,400 staff members at SRI, uh, consolidated revenues about 500 million. They're all over the place. And SRI is now independent. It became independent around 1970 during the student riots, and uh, not riots, protests. And, uh, and so Stanford said, let's make them independent. And that was a great effect. Uh, this is the bragging chart. That's, I want to get past this as quickly as possible. But SRI has a long history, and not just an old history, of succeeding in commercialization. They actually, the first mouse, um, I'll try this little thing that I bought. The first mouse uh, from Doug Engelbart was invented and patented at, at SRI. Uh, after that, it went to Xerox Park, where they did a lot of the uh, application development, and after that to Apple, obviously, and others. Uh, this is the napkin on which the internet des was designed. That's the complete internet at the time. SRI is in red, receiving bits from UCLA. The first login was log, and then it dropped after before in could come out. Um, uh, we do everything, which is really exciting. Malaria, drugs, and uh, new types of, uh, of neurological and cancer drugs. Uh, Academy Awards, Emmys. I was on the one that uh, related to HDTV. Uh, on the team, I should say. Those little numbers on your check we did. Siri was most recently uh, in 2010. Uh, one of our startups that got acquired. So it, it, it's, it's consistent. We're building lots. OK. Um, this is just a list of the companies that we've helped create. And you have that kind of average impact that you expect from venture capital. Actually, better performance than you might expect from a normal venture capital firm. Somewhere about between 1 in 10 and 1 in 20 of our uh, startups are home runs. Namely, they create you know, 10 to 100 times their value to us. Many times the startups are singles and doubles, maybe, meaning they return their value back or a little more. And, uh, and we've actually never had 
a true bankruptcy um, where, where everybody lost everything. So uh, it's been quite a, quite a ride. And what's really interesting is, unlike uh, other venture models, we create only three or four ventures a year. Don't, like 1,500 projects, $500 million going in, three or four ventures. But the reason for that is because of why I wrote this book. We only focused on creating ventures that could be home runs, billion dollar companies, breakthrough companies that could really make a difference in the world. And um, similarly, Henry at Warburg Pincus did the same. Henry's a great researcher, and he and I together were at RCA Labs before we came out here, uh, before he came to the venture community and I came out here. Um, as you can see, materials, biomed, all of those technologies. OK, um, you know, if you had to say the moral to the story here about creating breakthrough companies, it's really here. Uh, if you have achieved, and if you want to have accomplished great things, great aim, you fix your gaze, and it sometimes seems impossible, and you stay consistent. This is why I have difficulty with the fail fast, fail often, pivot often model. And we'll draw a picture later if we have questions. But over time, when you're creating a venture, what do you iterate on? What do you iterate on? In the venture capital world, sorry, what do you iterate on? And what you don't iterate on is your core value proposition. You rarely iterate on your team. You rarely iterate and change on whether you're a consumer or an enterprise play after you've been funded. Before you're funded, anything goes. Before you, re you take external money, you can iterate, decide on your own venture concept, and really make it work. And I'll show you how that works. OK, in terms of the technology that we helped create companies from, um, it really comes from the Bayh-Dole Act. Does anybody know Bayh-Dole? Raise your hands if you know it. OK, so in the US, back in 1980, Birch Bay and Bob Dole passed a law that said, um, if you do projects for the government and, it's, and you're a nonprofit institution, such as a university or a lab, then you can own all the commercial rights of anything you do, any breakthroughs you achieve. That is an incredible war chest of technology that comes to Stanford, Berkeley, SRI, all of these. That is the basis of it. And the crime of it is we do breakthrough technology. Our number one customer was DARPA. We do breakthrough technology, and then it may just sit on the shelf. And the real iteration doesn't occur. It doesn't drive up the value curve. And instead, we just go to the next great invention. So um, the Bayh-Dole Act is there. We can own the commercial rights. That gives you the incentive to do commercial success. And by the way, we give at SRI, we gave a third of what we got back to employees. That's one reason SRI wasn't hollowed out by um, the nearby companies that could easily recruit all their staff, okay? Because they could have a portfolio of stock or of royalty and continue uh, to stay at SRI. Okay, on creating value propositions, does everybody know what a value proposition is? Raise your hands, okay. Believe me, you have to know if you're starting a venture. There are four elements, and, I'll, and be, in the book it's repeated multiple times. If you want to start a great venture, there are four things you need. One is a great market problem, really a pain point, unless it's consumer. In consumer, it's a different kind of pain point. In an enterprise, a pain point for a market problem is customers or, or companies have extreme pain, have some problem they want to solve, and you can solve it. So market pain, a, a disruptive and differentiated solution. Disruptive only because these days, if you only have an incremental solution, you're not going to win. Somebody else is going to apply an incremental solution. And um, a great team and a great value proposition. We're going to get into that. This is about value propositions. And so this is actually the SRI process. It's a mnemonic for N, uh, called NABC. It's actually not the full value proposition. The book lists that. I'll give it to you in a minute on a page. 
but a full value proposition is the beginning of a value proposition, and these arrows indicate iteration, starts with customer and market needs. It's remarkable in a technology space, people don't think normally that way. When people have a great technology, I've got a great, you know, a great new processing or a great new bandwidth or whatever, with that kind of problem, they don't think naturally of what market are they reaching, what customer are they reaching, what pain point are they solving. That is a crucial element. So basically everyone that we work with had to start with and iterate on a customer and market need, then look for the differentiated and disruptive solutions, both business and technical. Then try to quantify the benefits. And I'll tell you what we did with Siri in that case. And then try to, and then always articulate the competition and alternative approaches, and then iterate again and again and again. Okay? That's when you're creating a company. When you really have the concept, when you're iterating on the concept. And so, in some sense, this is crucial to do and actually crucial to continue. But once the funding starts, you have far less flexibility because then you have a lifetime established by the amount of money that you've been given and a runway to get there and a goal to get there. And that's why this is so important to have ahead of time. I'm not going to go through the SRI uh, process for creating ventures, but it's one more generally that's open to any research institution or lab that wants to spin out companies, starting with a concept internally funding it, using external venture capital support. We have great friends in the, external, in the venture capital world, and then uh, building a venture or license. When I told you earlier we only do three or four ventures a year, we probably do 20 or 30 or 40 licenses that don't meet the, the strategy of, of breakthrough. OK, so let's go to the story of Siri. How many people here think that Siri started with we have great natural language understanding. We have great speech technology. We, we had started the original nuance. We knew what we were doing. We had AI, so we needed to figure out what venture we could have. How many think so? Good, very good. OK, it wasn't. We, didn't, we knew that there were certain opportunities that were created that were remarkable, that we knew that the mobile phone had. And those opportunities were, you know, they were, they had more power than a supercomputer 10 years earlier. They were always on, always connected. They had more storage and, and bandwidth capabilities than, um, and, and at the time, only ringtones and SMS messages were the dominant apps. We didn't know what we wanted to do, but we knew that we were on the, on a, on the, uh, the leading edge of most every computing revolution at SRI. So what are we going to do? Well, part of it started by accident. Kalo was started by the government, DARPA. DARPA, our number one customer. Kalo stands for Cognitive Assistant that Learns and Organizes. That meant an agent. They were happy. They liked agent technology. Agent meaning delegate technology to some software. We didn't know what the business was, the model was, or anything. But they started a program. We led it. SRI was the project lead. We had 23 subs from the who's who of the AI world. You know, Stanford, Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Berkeley, you name it. They're all there. SRI was the prime. And uh, we worked on KLL a five-year program, the largest program in the history of the US government in artificial intelligence. The second inspiration was, and this came from actually DARPA, was MASH. Does, how many people know MASH? Raise your hands, please. OK. So do you remember in MASH, this guy here, over here, Radar O'Reilly? So Radar always knew what the colonel wanted before the colonel knew what the colonel wanted. That was the thing about radar. And so DARPA wanted to create a radar for you. What they really wanted to do was create a, um, a, an assistant that would allow you and give you insight into your life and support you in your life like radar did 
to give you an assistant with real-time knowledge. It was called learning in the wild. Everybody knew you could do AI in large volumes of massive data, but learning in the wild meant you had to do it in real time as the person was, was, was walking along, doing their activities and all. And that was what that program was at, and that was a great inspiration. Okay, so I told you earlier, there's four things that it takes to do a great venture. That's it. You're, as you leave this room, you can all decide these are the four things you need. Obviously, it's hard to do each one, and the book is about how to do that. It's about the market need and the opportunities, the team. Breakthrough for Siri started and happened actually not because of Kalo, not because of DARPA, but because we finally found a market pain point. We were seeking what's the problem that we could really solve with a Rader O'Reilly kind of capability. What's the market opportunity we could create? And finally, we realized at the time that mobile phones, and this was 2007, June of 2007, that mobile phones were difficult to use to access web services like OpenTable, Yelp, Hotels.com. They were all there getting, building their APIs for the customers. And they were losing 20% of their customers for every click that people had to do. People were not used to clicking. They didn't know how to do that. And so, or at least they didn't want to. And so what happened was that we created the market problem finally. We understood that the problem is, the pain point of the market was not clicking, to have a zero click solution. And that's what we created. That's why we created Siri. We wanted Siri to give answers, not links. We didn't want people to have to go and then link and click on the next. We didn't want Siri to be a search engine. We wanted it to be a do engine. And that was the basis for the value proposition. The business, the business function, the business, uh, the, uh, the uh, revenue model was lead generation. If we could lead you to OpenTable or to any other hotels.com or whatever, they would pay us for that lead. Okay, so it was click per action. And that was the business model. And together with that, we created the basis for Siri. Now, I'm not going to go through this, but in the book, these are the 11 steps that you really need to do to create a venture fundable value proposition. They're beyond NABC, obviously. But NABC is actually the core elements of that. If you could do that, if you can do your NABC, you can get started in what the opportunity is. It's in the book. This page identically, is almost identically in the book. OK, so then Siri, all of a sudden, um, in 2010, April, actually we launched the company, the first product in February. How much time do we have, by the way? There's no, there's no, oh, one theory. I'm going to be finished soon so we can all go through it. In February 2010, we launched the company and um, get this phone call. The CEO, Doug Kitless of Siri, and I was on the board as well as being a co-founder. The, the CEO gets a phone call on his cell phone Hi, this is Steve. And he says, Steve who? And he says, Steve Jobs. And he says, sure. And he hangs up. <laughs> so then it comes back again. He calls again and he says, hi. No, really, this is Steve Jobs. And so Steve called and um, talked to the CEO. He invited the three founders that were part of the team. I was not. I was still at SRI running the ventures activity to his house. And from that point on, he's, there was a there was a honeymoon period between the founders and him um, over a period of two to four weeks where um, the board originally said, do not discuss any funding activities. But ultimately, we were invested in by venture capitalists and by a team that really wanted to make a difference by having their work go to tens or hundreds of millions of people. And the venture capitals were offered a, 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 an opportunity that would give them a very fine reward. We can't tell you what that was because that's part of the uh, contract agreement that we would never specify how much that amount was. And that's what happened. I sent Steve a note afterwards say, and saying, you got a great company. 
it's on the board, and I and um, I hope that we can work together in the future. In his classic way, he sent me a note back, you know, very short, simply, we won't disappoint you. Now, you all know that, truthfully, Siri, on occasion, was and seemed disappointing. It, it, a lot of people, there isn't a person, rarely a person came up to me and said, I love Siri, period. It was always, I like Siri, but it's not recognizing me, or I ask it questions, and, and so on and so on. And of course, you have Google now as well. But it has made great progress, and it is being used by hundreds of millions of people around the world, and continues to be in every product. OK. So that's all about the story of Siri. That was chapter one. The rest of the chapters are trying to show you how to build opportunities from the great uh, from the great opportunities that exist today. Uh, th there are no greater opportunities, in my opinion, than now. There's globalization, demographics, the adversary between, in particular, cybersecurity, um, the growing markets, particularly in China, revolutionary technologies, they're all happening now. Uh, you guys are probably all involved in various pieces of this. This is why I'm excited to talk to you. Um, there's breakthroughs in virtually every area and in, in, in advanced by technology. I mean, these in particular, microsatellites that are, you, fo you folks have a loon project, but maybe others in the CubeSats, they're going to be f uh, circling the world and giving and basically creating whole new infrastructure for wireless carriers. Um, autonomous vehicles, look at what you've done. Something wonderful in terms of creating the, the original breakthroughs in that space. Healthcare devices, I'm particularly involved in right now. I, I, when I left SRI, I began uh, advising as a venture advisor a few startups. And in healthcare devices, given the fact that you can sequence genomes, and not only your own, but the genomes of, of the bacteria or viruses or the tumors, we're in for a huge breakthrough in the ability for people to improve their health and wellness. Um, I was really uh, excited by this because we helped make this device. A woman in um, the Boston Marathon lost her leg. She was a dancer. And 18 months later, Hugh Hare from MIT, who also has lost his legs, he was, a, he was an MIT professor, is an MIT professor, showed what could be done in the whole new world of, of uh, prosthetics. This is just an example, of the tiny example of what could be done with robotics and personalized robotics. And 18 months later, this, this TED, let me get my, this brief, I'm going to do a brief uh, TED, um, a cut of that TED talk. Look at how beautifully that leg and the actuators, which are driven by her own muscle have enabled her to use her legs again to dance. This was her first time that she was dancing. This kind of robotic system, helping people, assisting people, is now within you know two years. You've just seen the DARPA Robotics Challenge recently, where robots are walking and performing activities. We are also building at SRI exoskeletons without We're also building exoskeletons without the exoskeleton. So using human um, uh, bones as the skeleton, and we're doing exo muscles for people to wear outfits. This is the world you're in. OK. Um, another part of the book is about the investors, how the great investors act and what they look for. Um, of course, I hear so many times, you know, venture capitalists, vulture capitalists, whatever, you know, and then what kind of deal are they offering? This book is about the kind of deal they really offer. It's not about the money, it's, and it's not even about the equity terms. It's about what kind of value they offer you in their networks of friends, their wisdom and their guidance in creating and running the venture. 
their, um, their ability to help you recruit, and so on. This is what you use, and this is what's described. Um, I'm going to tell you one thing and about talking to great investors. If you have a great value, uh, venture concept, there's only three things, that, and these are some of them. This is Mike Moritz, Vinod Kosla, Kevin Effersey at Excel, Steve Jurvetson, Gary Morgan Taylor. These are all greats. Okay? There are three things they're always looking for in your first venture, your first presentation to them. So don't forget the three things. That's in the book, but I'm not telling you. No, I will. I will. Um, the, first, the three things are, one, you have to show them you have a deeply compelling value proposition. Deeply compelling. Something that's a change the world. I'm talking about the greats now. Something that really is a change the world value proposition. Secondly, you have to show them that you're committed to it. This is another issue that I have with the fail fast, fail often. You have to show you have passion for the idea, and you're, you've wanted it, you've lived it, you want it to happen, and you're going to do anything. You know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're going to be there to make that happen. That's what they want to see from you. And the third thing they're going to want to see from you is that you can execute. You're not there in pie in the sky. You're there and you're telling them, look, I'm going to be able to go to the first step. I'm going to get in the analogy that uh, Vinod Kosla uses to base camp. When you're climbing Mount Everest, I'm going to get to a base camp. I'm going to get there. I'm going to have this much money. I'm going to have this team. And I'm going to keep it lean. And I'm going to keep it aggressive. Those kind of things are in the three things that you need to achieve. There's also five meetings that are listed in the book. That's the first meeting. You achieve that. You know, in my principle, you know, Woody Allen says, you know, 80% of life is showing up. If you achieve that, the Norman Winarski principle is 20% of life is knowing when to leave. So you got to go, and you've achieved what you did. OK. Teams and execution, it's obvious again. We talk about how to build teams and when to build teams. And the ego related to teams, teams, you could be a founder, you could be a CEO. You don't need to be both. Um, you could, you, you want to bring a team in and keep your money as lean as possible, and so on. Um, this is how to execute a breakthrough invest, uh, uh, venture. And it's all in the book. Choosing the CEO, the founders, choosing the right investors, and maintaining the value proposition. The mistakes that I've seen and Henry's seen over these dozens of companies, some are not avoidable. Like the world changes, the government changes the standard, whatever. But some of them are avoidable. And these are the five we describe in the book. So fail to know your customer. I started a company that I thought was the best possible company you can imagine in terms of um, communications. It was going to do mobile ad hoc networking. People were going to, firefighters and people like that were going to be able to use it with the internet, running up the stairs to, you know, with them instead of leaving them without communications as what happened in 9-11. Um, that company failed because the CEO really wasn't deeply knowledgeable. It was a great idea, but the CEO and nor the VP of marketing were deeply knowledgeable about that community of the firefighters, the emergency responders. And so, the book describes how that failed. Keep the wrong CEO. This is, a, this is a challenge in business schools all over the world. People still think, is it the horse or the rider? What happens if you have a great CEO? Um, which, is, which is more important, a great CEO or a great company? I'm going to leave it to you to read the book. But I'll tell you, we come out on CEO. And many of the business schools in the like come out on, you know, it's the great company. Mismanaged finances, that means there's obvious ways you can do that. You hire too much, you, hire, you, um, you, give to, you, you have too much engineering, services, too many human labor components, um, and so on. Becoming overconfident is remarkably uh, a remarkable failure. It's when you become blind to your competitors. You're doing so well that you're just not even open to considering competitors. You might think of Nokia in that space, for example. And fail to anticipate future industry developments. A lot of that is in the book as well. So I want to keep going on, because we're near done, and I want you to ask questions. Um, 
Finally, this book is about how to maintain an ambidextrous organization. That's a word that's actually not in the book, but it's the word that Stanford uses. It's an organization that's both good at, at building and continuing their existing products and services, as well as innovating and create breakthrough products and services. That's the left hand, the right hand, that's the ambidextrous. Turns out that um, the average lifespan of a company, turn of the century around there, was 67 years. In a uh, company in the standard poor 500, the top 500 companies in the United States. What do you think the average lifespan of a company is around now? Guess, please. Ten years. Hmm? Ten years. 14 years. So if you're in the top 500 companies in the United States, you're in danger. You're going to be broken up or, or bought or um, in one way or another. Look at Kodak, Polaroid, or Oracle, Sun. You can just keep going on and on. So <clears throat> the book ends with a, an approach to ensuring the future, how we went about it, what we've done to do that, and, um, and what it takes to create centers of innovation. You have Google X here, which I think is actually a great model for continuing. I don't know the inner details about how you do it, because there has to be a lot about financial independence. It has to be top-level CEO support. It has to be um, new metrics and, and new, measure, new measurements that are not related to the, early, to the revenue that so dwarfs it in the beginning. And so there has to be a whole lot to creating and building um, a company and, and maintaining it in the 21st century. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, uh, I have a quick question. Um, let's say I have a breakthrough idea. Um, at, at which point, like, at, at what stage does it make sense to engage venture capitalists like okay. SRI? Like, what's the MVP to, to okay. take to the yeah, venture yeah. capitalists? So if you have a breakthrough idea, the, what they're going to look for and by the way, that's where your iteration occurs. Do I have the right market? I have the right market? Well, no. It's too broad a market. Do I have the right solution? No, the technology solution only works for a narrower space or whatever. So you're, and then finally, do I have a team? A venture capitalist will not normally consider strongly something where they can, which is called heavy lifting, where they have to go help recruit the CEO, where they have to help go recruit the key people. So there needs to be a core team. They don't have to be working for the company, but they have to have come together and said, we're going to be founder, CEO. This is where the technology is going to come from. Here's our value proposition. And here's the beginnings of a value proposition, at least. Here's the competition. Here's all these elements. Here's the risks. And then you go in front of them. Now, these days, you can also go in front of angels as you know, individual, wealthy individuals, instead of venture capitalists. You could start with wealthy angels. The truth is I would still go to great venture capitalists because they'll watch you, they'll track you, they'll see how you're doing. Sometimes they'll fund you. Somebody like a Vinod Kosla likes to come in very early. He can either do seed or A. Mike Moritz believes in people like you. He believes in, you know, in people that have breakthrough ideas who are um, energized and passionate, and it's their idea, and they want to make it happen. So get the four elements in, of, your, of your company in mind, your team, core team. Only, you only need three or four people who are going to come together. Your market problem and value proposition, your differentiated technology, and you better understand your competition. And the goal is to get to an A round. Yeah. So. Um, uh, you don't need to have um, an established running uh, business. Oh, no. Like, pe people can just still, let's say, have their own whatever no. jobs. That's a huge mistake people make, by the way, uh, against their own selves. When, you, when we started Siri, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a running product. The purpose of a venture capitalist or any other funder is to build the commercial product and to help it scale. If you try building the product on your own beforehand, first of all, you won't succeed very well because you'll usually have too little money. 
And secondly, you wouldn't have done it fast enough or, or uh, it had sufficient resources. Mm -hmm. So definitely, they will, they will love the fact that you're going to build the product or service with their money. You, don't, you need, and that was item number 11 in that deck, but you'll never get venture funding. I should never say never. That's a terrible thing. You'll never get, no, I did it again. <laughs> you're, you're unlikely to get venture funding unless, I mean, with a PowerPoint alone. That's just, that world's over, as far as I know, unless you're you know, a superstar. Then you need a PowerPoint, a team, and you need a demo, or a proof of concept of some form, mm -hmm. but not the whole product. Hello, thanks uh, for coming. So just as a context, I'm not very well read in the area. I'm just a little bit uh, curious and stuff. But from the little that I read, uh, when they talk about the dimensions is the time, right? the team, the business plan, and the idea. Yeah. Uh, so one of the articles I read kind of emphasized a more underlooked, I think, uh, concept of timing. Yeah. So I want to see if you can comment to that, the things that you have seen succeed or yeah. fail. Because I, I, my perspective is we want to believe that it, a lot depends on us, yeah. how good we are, how much experience. But maybe the reality is a lot like, was it the timing? And do we get some element of yeah, luck there? I, I, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, it, it's just as bad to be too early or too late. And just like the stock market, you can't time too well. So what you have to do is feel, it depends on what your problem is. Is the market problem painful enough? That's one thing I always look for. Is the market problem so painful? Such, in the case of medical, it's obvious. Something like a disease, like cancer or something, it's very, you, can, you can literally quantify it very easily. Is the market problem so painful that it's not going to go away? Okay, So that helps you with the timing. The second is, is your solution, is, is your technology solution mature, or are you really asking to do more research? I do not support more technology research. In each of these programs that we've built, there have been hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in, by the government funding, that's why I said it was so important, hundreds of millions of dollars towards building the technology. Do not ask a venture capitalist to come and help you build more technology. That's not going to happen. Go get your next co government contract or commercial contract or whatever. And so that part of timing is make sure your technology, if its technology is mature, or if it's a business model, make sure the business model is implementable, and make sure there's a base camp. So the final thing about timing is this idea of man Everest and base camp. Did anybody read Vinod on this? Or, uh, I'll explain it briefly. I'll, I'll explain it. It is true that you shouldn't try to climb Mount Everest all at once and somehow scale what you're trying to achieve all at once. Nobody will believe you. It's like boiling the ocean. You need to start with a narrative. It's really Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm kind of thing. You need to start with something that you think is achievable. And every time you do a round, and this book describes the rounds, the A round, the B round, the C round, and so forth. Every time you do a round, it's not for the money. You're doing a round to get the next achievement. What you wanted to achieve, with, you, you're going to first get the product. That'll probably be round A. Build, to, uh, and build revenue might be round B. Build profitability might be round C. Scale is round D, and so forth. Now, of course, those are different. But that's how timing helps you. But yes, a venture capitalist, each one of those rounds should never be more than 18 months. No venture capitalist would, in general, unless it's medical devices or healthcare, would expect to have their money last more than around 18 to 24 months. That's a good question. Other question? What suggestions do you have for future-proofing your vision, especially if you're not planning to go and fail safe and fail fast? Wait, uh, so what's... Uh, future proof your vision and I'll explain my there, vision yeah, yes. or rather if you have a venture and you have an idea you see market need yes and you have a vision and technology how to when solve it when you say it. you are you meaning you or me I'm just referring to like a, uh, a person or more, an entrepreneur person. right yeah. uh, and there can be I think you know opportunity to fail on both sides right yeah one you may create a solution which uh, by the time you actually implement it may be not the best way to solve this problem yeah. even though it does or you may create a solution where the market isn't ready. And there have been examples, I think, well, you, we can take even 
one of the examples we did the Google in Google X, Google Glass, where we went and learned a lot, yes. but we realized maybe it wasn't the right solution. Right. right. So uh, without going and trying to learn as much as possible and fail, how do you actually protect yourself from working too long on the solution which may not be the right one? Okay, so a couple things. One is a venture capitalist, again, the good ones, would not have allowed um, a long period of time for the first proof points to be there. So you would have had to form early proof points, and maybe the early proof points would have been where you are right now, which is, I think, quite a wonderful application of Google Glass with doctors using it, people like that. That might have been an early proof point as people started using it and experiencing it. Um, other ways that you can, uh, you're, you're getting into timing, in other words. You're saying, how do we know when, when, when there's an opportunity and how long should we work on it, right? Everything has to be broken up into it most, into milestones within 18 month chunks. And as you're moving along, if you're not achieving those milestones, you're gonna start finding uh, difficulty to continue the funding. So one of the things you emphasized was finding the right team, yes. bringing the right team to the venture. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of us probably have a great idea, Yeah. but lack the help to get that idea off the ground. Right. So what do you do in that kind of case? What do you so, suggest for somebody? That so has? let me tell you how we did that. And, 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 and we had that problem every single time. When you're in a research lab like SRI with 2,400 people, most of the people are researchers. That's sort of a tautology. So, um, and, and so how do you get the team? What we did is the first thing we did was build a value proposition, just like we talked about. You can do that with your internal team as, le as, as well as you can. You're really not a domain expert usually in the market. You're not a, an executive yet, but you do that. Once you have that, you, you use your own network or venture capitalists will help you. You're, they're not funding you, they'll just give you insight. You start re looking for the CEO of your dreams or the VP of product or the VP of marketing or the like. Don't bring them on, don't even, you don't need to. Just bring the, the you know, get the gang together. We're gonna save the orphanage now, you know, the Booths brothers. So get the gang together and then iterate again on the value proposition too. You get something solid, then you have the team, you have the value proposition. You still have the problem of intellectual property if it's, a, if it's a technology company. If it's a business company, it's a little different. And, uh, and so you'll have to have probably, if it's intellectual property, you'll probably want to know who has the patents or, or who can do what or can you get it from Stanford or whatever. And so that's, that's really how you do it. You, you can build. If you've got somebody that's both a founder and a CEO, like you know, Larry and Sergey kind of people, God bless, go ahead. But if you don't, that doesn't mean you can't start this. You absolutely can. Because those kind of people are looking for these kind of opportunities. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.